Hey, if you're watching this video and you want to be really cool, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. And also there's a link in the description to my website on YouTube. You could click on the YouTube description link if you want to check that out. Thanks. So today we're going to, again, to the third Patriarch of Zen, page four in the little booklet. If you want to see any of the previous videos I did on it, there also will be a link to that playlist in the description on YouTube. So, this is how it starts. The arising of self, the arising of others gives rise to self. Giving rise to self generates other. Know these seeming two as facets of the one fundamental reality. In this emptiness, these two are really one, and each contains all phenomena. If not comparing nor attached to refined and vulgar, you will not fall into judgment and opinion. The great way is embracing and spacious. To live in it is neither easy nor difficult. Those who rely on limited views are fearful and irresolute. The faster they hurry, the slower they go. To have a narrow mind and to be attached to getting enlightenment is to lose one's center and go astray. When one is free from attachment, all things are as they are, and there is neither coming nor going. When in harmony with the nature of things, your true fundamental nature, you will walk freely and undisturbed. However, when the mind is in bondage, the truth is hidden, and everything is murky and unclear. So, first couple lines in here. The arising of other gives rise to self. Giving self, giving rise to self generates other. Knowing these seeming two facets of the one fundamental reality. So that just means that there's the illusion that I'm separate from you, but really that we are all dependent on each other and that I can't know who I am or that I exist or that I'm separate or whatever I pretend to be without that being in reference to somebody else. I can't know who I am or what I stand for or even that I'm a separate person unless there's a you that's separate from me. And so they seem as two separate facets, but really it's part of one reality. It's all dependent on each other so that even if I was not here, this whole universe would be different in some way because there's not one part of it that's more important than another. It all works in harmony to be as the way it is. So if you didn't exist, actually everything would be slightly a little bit different in the entire world. And so it goes on to say, in this emptiness, these two are really one and each contains all phenomena. So every single, every single part of the whole, including me, including you, including objects, animals, plants, really is the whole thing each part of it and contained inside. And that's why it is said that you contain the universe inside yourself. Each part is actually the whole. It's just the illusion that makes them appear to be separate. If not comparing nor attached to refined and vulgar, you'll not fall into judgment and opinion. Well, and that's what we talk about a lot. When, if I compare this versus that and right versus wrong and I get attached, to certain ideas versus others, or a big attachment is to certain feelings. I like feeling good feelings. I don't like feeling anxiety. I don't like feeling stress. I don't like feeling insecurity. Those aren't me, but when I feel joy and happiness, those are the real me. So I'm attached to certain feelings. I compare the acts of this person versus the acts of this person. I Sure, I have my character defects, but the character defects you have are worse. I would never do those. You know, um, I might be bad because I steal things, but I'm not as bad as somebody who's a sexual predator. Or you might be bad because you're an alcoholic, but you're not as bad as a drug addict. Or I prefer, I really like dogs, but cats disgust me. And any such things. So falling into judgment and opinion is something that, a lot of people think are normal. I mean, in modern spiritual spirituality, like New Age spirituality, we do talk, people do talk a lot about being free from judgment. But in everyday life, people really don't see what's wrong with, 
you know, it doesn't make sense to have something wrong with an opinion. Like, what's wrong with having an opinion? What's wrong with having judgments about things? That's just part of living life, right? And so it, it's about the attachment to the judgments and the opinions. So I could say, sure, I prefer having a chocolate milkshake to having an Oreo milkshake. Sure, I'd rather have a chocolate milkshake. But if I get an Oreo milkshake, that's okay too. That's just as interesting as if I would have had the chocolate milkshake. So I could have an opinion. Sure, I want this person to win the presidency versus this person. That's my opinion. But if it turns out differently, that's okay too. So just without, I don't hate the other side of the opinion. So without such a strong attachment to opinions and judgment. The great way is embracing and spacious. To live in it is neither easy nor difficult. And that reminds me of, in Buddhism, there's a thing called, on the Noble Eightfold Path, it's called a right effort. So you put the right effort, which means you don't push too hard and you don't not do anything. It's sort of an art. And that's why it says to live in the great way, to live in harmony with the Tao or the universe is neither easy nor difficult. So it's sort of like a balancing act. You do the acts, you do what you have to do, you do your spiritual practices, but you also know that there's so many different factors that are outside of your control that it's all ultimately happening in God's time and God's will. So there has to be a blending there. So that doesn't mean you sit around and do nothing, but it also doesn't mean you have a nervous breakdown because you force yourself to try and control the world with your ego. So that's sort of right effort. And those who rely on limited views are fearful and irresolute. The faster they hurry, the slower they go. So if you rely on your ego for everything, on your analytical mind, on your limited views about things, even though you might seem confident on the outside internally, it just gives you more fear and you're unsure and you're uncertain of yourself and you really think that you're separate from the rest of the world and you have to fight against it. And like it says, the faster you hurry and whatever you're trying to get done, I gotta do this and this and this, the slower you really, the slower you accomplish anything internally. The slower you go, you're always sort of tripping over yourself. You never really get anywhere. And so to have a narrow mind and be attached to getting enlightenment, enlightenment is to lose one's center and go astray. When one is free from attachment, all things are as they are and there's neither coming or going. <clears throat> So, and this is a Zen text, and Zen really emphasizes that you already are the Buddha, or you already are the enlightened being. And it's sort of, there's a poem by Thich Nhat Hanh that describes a river going down to the ocean, becoming a stream and everything going back to the ocean. So if the river's too focused on getting to the ocean, if the person's too focused on getting to enlightenment, that's not the way, the proper way of looking at things. One, they'll get there slower. And two, it's about the journey there. So the river already is the ocean. So it's a paradox. It's a balancing act because the river already is enlightened. It already is the ocean ultimately. But it's also flowing back at the same time. So it's, you are going back to God. You are going back to oneness. But also, you're it already, too. So to be where you're at and reflect what you can reflect, and that's why it says here to be attached. If the river is just attached to being the ocean, one, it's going to move slower. The faster it hurries, the slower it's going to go. And two, it's not going to reflect what it's supposed to reflect where it's at because it's attached to being somewhere else. So it's important for the river to be where it is and remember it is perfect how it is and also that it is going back to oneness. And so when one's free from attachment, when I don't need to be anywhere, I don't need to do anything, I don't need to feel any type of way, not that I don't feel things and do things and feel types of ways and be places, but I'm not attached to one in particular, then things are as they are and there's neither coming or going and that's why it said I accept things as they are. Even this moment of me speaking right now, it is what it is. It's here, it's now, there's no, I mean, where are you gonna come to? Where are you gonna go? What do you, what do you want to be different than how it is? What do you wanna do differently that you don't do now? 
you know, and so a lot of times self-transformation, transformation of your being comes through acceptance of what is. And that's when things change and that's when new energy is released and that's when you have the courage to take action. So when free from attachment, things are as they are and there's neither coming nor going because you're always, you're always just right here. You're always just right now. And so then it says, when in harmony with the nature of things, which is your own fundamental nature, so it's saying when you're in harmony with the universe, which is how you're supposed to be, you will walk freely and undisturbed. However, when the mind is in bondage, so when you're trapped in your mind, the truth is hidden, which means you can't see things as they are, and everything is murky and unclear. So, you know, there's lots of pain and suffering, and it's all pretty much held within mind. I mean, if you think about anything that's ever happened in your life, it's your mind's reaction to it that brings about pain and suffering. And that's why in spiritual traditions, such a great emphasis is placed on meditation because it brings about a equanimity, a calming of the mind, a reaching into deeper truths, deeper states of being. Because it's not that the mind in itself is um, inherently bad. You know, nothing's inherently good or bad. But our mind just races and it's so full of thoughts and we identify so much with those thoughts we put so much energy into them that they keep going and they keep flowing they keep moving on and so before this next little part is going to be on the next page but since it's a continuation of the same paragraph i'll finish it up real quick and the burdensome practice of judging brings annoyance and wariness what benefit can be derived from attachment to distinctions and separation? So this text focuses so much on judgment and opinion. So it says here again, the practice of judging becomes so burdensome on yourself. You know, you're always just having to judge this from that, this person from that person. And it, it makes you wary of the world, wary of the goodness of things. It makes you annoyed. The harder you judge others, the harder you judge yourself. Somebody who's very judgmental to other people, that means they don't have much love for themselves. Because if you love yourself fully, you wouldn't do that. So you hate others, you judge others, you talk about others. If I do that, it's because I don't love myself that much because if I love myself, what am I, you know, if I love myself and I'm centered in the self, I know all things are perfect. They are as they are. What do I have to judge somebody else's path? What do I have to say about where they're at or where they're supposed to be? And that's what it says here. What benefit can be derived from being attached to distinctions and separations? It just separates. It causes, causes more um, more disunity takes us away from harmony. What benefit can be derived from such other than continued perpetuation of the cycle of birth and death? 